Hello again. So this is going to be a talk about hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism, plainly put, is an elevation of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone comes in two forms, T3 and T4. Now most of the T3 and T4 in the bloodstream is bound to a protein called thyroid binding globulin, and hence it's inactive. Uh, T3 and T4 that's not bound to TBG is referred to as free T3 or free T4. And this is more biologically active. This is the only way thyroid hormone can act as if it's not bound. And T3 is approximately three to, times, uh, uh, three to four times more active than T4. Okay, so primary hyperthyroidism. This is generally what hyperthyroidism is, is primary hyperthyroidism, 99% of the time. And what that is going to be is an elevated thyroid hormone that's due to an increased production by the thyroid for one reason or another. The thyroid is creating too much thyroid hormone and that's why you have hyperthyroidism. Uh, and it's, it's simply due to the fact that uh, the thyroid is creating too much thyroid hormone. It has nothing to do with the input. And so because you're going to have high T3 and high T4, you're therefore going to have a low TSH because you have negative feedback. In secondary hyperthyroidism, the hyperthyroidism is secondary to the elevated TSH. So in this case, you have stimulation of the thyroid by TSH, and that's why it's called secondary hyperthyroidism. So while you'll still have high T3 and high T4, you have elevated TSH because the cause is actually the elevated TSH. So there's no negative feedback. I mean, there is negative feedback, but you have elevated TSH as the cause. So this would be, for instance, uh, like a uh, pituitary adenoma. The symptoms of hyperthyroidism are going to be the same regardless of whether it's primary or secondary hyperthyroidism. And that's nervousness, emotional lability, tremor, insomnia, sweating, heat intolerance, weight loss, increased appetite, palpitations, which can be a sign of atrial fibrillation, warm and moist skin, menstrual changes, and hypercalcemia. The hypercalcemia is actually due to the fact that thyroid hormone activates osteoclast activity. So this is a picture of some of the symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Okay, so when you suspect thyroid symptoms, when you suspect hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism for that matter, the best initial test is going to be TSH. That will rule it in or rule it out right away. If you have a patient with hyperthyroidism indeed, then you should have a high T3 and high T4 and then a either low or high TSH. Now generally, you're going to be getting thyroid function uh, panels. So you're going to be getting a TSH, T3, and T4 altogether. So provided that the patient is stable, the best initial test is to get a TSH. The differential diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. So we already talked about primary hyperthyroidism and secondary hyperthyroidism. What they have in common is that they both have high T3 and high T4. The difference is that primary has a low TSH, secondary has a high TSH. Some of the things that can cause symptoms that are similar to what we see in hyperthyroidism are pheochromocytoma. So a pheochromocytoma is a tumor of the adrenal gland that secretes uh, epinephrine. In this case, you're going to have a very elevated blood pressure. That doesn't happen so much in hyperthyroidism. You may get the tachycardia, but you're not going to have a severely elevated blood pressure. Acute manic episode uh, can present similar to hyperthyroidism, but in acute manic episodes, you're going to be limited to the psychiatric symptoms of hyperthyroidism. For instance, the nervousness, perhaps tremor, insomnia, but you're not going to have changes in appetite. You're not going to have weight loss. Uh, you're not going to have uh, palpitations. And then cocaine and amphetamine intoxications can present similarly too, uh, with the nervousness and fatigue, uh, perhaps not so much fatigue as much as insomnia, um, 
uh, but you're not going to have weight loss, um, and certainly you're not going to have menstrual changes. Okay, so this is a differential diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. We're going to talk about the primary and secondary causes. The secondary causes, really, we sort of talked about in uh, the, the uh, anterior pituitary diseases. Uh, so we're not going to touch too much on them here. Uh, but we're going to primarily talk about the primary hyperthyroidism diseases. So primary hyperthyroidism is a low TSH and high T3 and T4. The one we're going to focus most on is Graves' disease, which is the number one cause of hyperthyroidism. Toxic nodular goiter, that can be a single adenoma or multiple nodules. We talked mostly about that in the, uh, in the thyroiditis and thyroid cancer section. Uh, Subacute thyroiditis, lymphocytic and postpartum thyroiditis, talked about that in the thyroiditis section, so we're not going to focus on that too much here. Hashitoxicosis, we talked about that in the thyroiditis section. Struma ovarii is a disease uh, that's uh, an, it's a gynecologic disease. It's a benign tumor uh, in the ovaries, uh, and it's a thyroid-secreting tissue. We're not going to talk about that either too much here. One, because it's rare. Two, because it's not really a thyroid disease. It's, a, it's an OBGYN disease. Uh, we will talk about how you can differentiate it, though. And then exogenous intake of thyroid hormone, which is a factitious disorder. That's a psychiatric disorder. Okay, so Graves' disease. So as I mentioned, this is the number one cause of hyperthyroidism in the U.S., and this is a thyroid disease of autoimmune origin. So as we know, most autoimmune diseases are going to be more common in women. And indeed, Graves' disease is more common in women by uh, a factor of about 7 to 8 to 1. And in this case, with Graves' disease, what you have is a circulating immunoglobulin, an antibody, that's actually stimulating the TSH receptors. And so because of that, you've got a thyroid that's just basally active all the time, uh, regardless of whether or not you're secreting higher or lower levels of TSH. You have an immunoglobulin that's constantly stimulating the thyroid. And so you're going to have a low TSH level because you will have negative feedback. The immunoglobulins are not TSH, they're immunoglobulins but you're going to have an elevated T3 and T4. As I mentioned, they're much more common, this is much more common in women, and the age of onset tends to be in uh, the 20s to 40s. Graves' disease, like other autoimmune disease, is associated with other autoimmune disorders, so you may have uh, patients with Graves' disease that also happen to have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. And along with the hyperthyroid symptoms, which we already mentioned, Graves' disease is uh, notoriously associated with ocular symptoms, particularly ophthalmoplegia, which is paralysis uh, or pain moving uh, the eye muscles, and exophthalmos, which is a bulging eye. And then it's also associated with dermatologic symptom known as pretibial myxedema, which is an induration and erythema of the skin over the, uh, over the shin. So the symptoms of Graves' disease are going to include your typical symptoms of hyperthyroidism, nervousness, lability, insomnia, tremor, weight loss, increased appetite, uh, goiter, palpitation, sensitivity to heat, menstrual changes, uh, and then the visual changes and the pretibial myxedema. I put in boldface the ones that tend to be commonly uh, put up on the USMLE. You're not going to be necessarily told all of these symptoms, but the ones that tend to be told on the USMLE are the ones I put in boldface. Uh, note that all, all diseases ca causing hyperthyroidism cause goiter because you're causing an increased production of thyroid hormone, uh, with the exception of one, and we'll get to that. But all diseases that cause hyperthyroidism will cause goiter to some extent, and goiter is just an enlarged thyroid. On physical exam, in patients with Graves' disease, uh, really any patient with hyperthyroidism, you should note increased heart rate, 
the goiter, warm and moist skin, and a fine tremor. For diagnosis, the best initial test for any patient where you suspect hyperthyroidism is going to be a TSH level, and that's just to document that this indeed is primary hyperthyroidism and not secondary hyperthyroidism. If you're suspecting Graves' disease, then the most accurate test is going to be a serology for that thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin. If that comes back positive, that's diagnostic of Graves' disease. Other labs that you may get, uh, like for instance a CBC, that can show a normocytic anemia, and that's because Graves' disease, being an autoimmune disease, can cause anemia of chronic disease. Uh, your metabolic profile could show hypercalcemia, and that's because in hyperthyroidism, uh, you have elevated T3, and T3 activates the osteoclasts. The treatment for Graves' disease is uh, really twofold. So we're treating the symptoms and we're treating the disease. To treat the symptoms, we use the selective beta blocker propranolol. That's the best beta blocker uh, to use, and that's to control the symptoms. As far as treating Graves' disease itself, we can go one of two routes. We can use medical therapy or we can do definitive therapy. Medical therapy would be with antithyroid drugs, that would be propothiol uracil or methimazole. But the definitive therapy is going to be injecting the patient with radioiodine, and that's actually going to destroy the thyroid altogether. So the only time we don't want to use radioiodine is in pregnant women or in children. So if we want to treat Graves' disease medically, in patients who are pregnant or who are children, we're going to use PTU. And we're only going to use PTU in pregnant women. We cannot use methimazole in pregnant women. Methimazole is contraindicated in pregnancy. So if we, uh, we can do surgery in pregnant women or children, um, and if we do surgery, we would do a subtotal thyroidectomy. But often the case is that we're going to just administer PTU and then do the radioiodine ablation when it's appropriate. So after the woman delivers her baby, then afterwards, then yes, you can do radioiodine ablation. But just remember that radioiodine ablation is not done in children or in pregnant women. And if you're going to give medical therapy to a pregnant woman, you uh, should use PTU. You can't use methimazole. And if you really have to do a definitive therapy in a pregnant woman or a child, then the definitive therapy is subtotal thyroidectomy. And so this is just a sort of graphical overview of what we went over. One thing that I'll add is if the patient comes in acutely with palpitations, you should probably get an, you should definitely get an EKG uh, to check to see if the patient is in atrial fibrillation. That tends to happen with, uh, with Graves' disease, with any hyperthyroidism really. Um, propranolol would be appropriate anyway for atrial fibrillation. And then if the labs for thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin are not available, then you can get a radioactive iodine uptake scan, RAIU scan. And what that should show is a confluently high uptake uh, and no evidence of adenoma or nodules. So you shouldn't have hot spots, you should just have a confluently active thyroid on your scan. And you're only going to get the RAIU scan if either the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin scan is not available or, sorry, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin test is not available, or if it's negative. It generally shouldn't be negative, but uh, if it's not available, then you can get an RAIU scan to, develop, uh, to diagnose Graves' disease, and like I said, it should be a confluently high uptake. We'll look at pictures of RAIU scans in a little bit. Okay, so this is uh, some pictures of goiter. And when you're doing a physical exam for goiter, uh, you really shouldn't do what this examiner is doing. Um, really, you should you shouldn't use the you should use the pads of your fingers rather than than uh, than 
the middle of your finger because you really want to be looking for uh, nodules as well. So, I mean, this would be okay if you're trying to feel for overall enlargement, but uh, you, you really should also, in addition to feeling for overall enlargement, you should be trying to feel for nodules too because that's part of your differential of hyperthyroidism. And the part of the neck that you're checking in a man would be right below the, uh, the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple right here. Uh, in a woman, you just kind of have to guesstimate where that would be, um, but it's, it's not far underneath uh, where, the, uh, where the, the fold is between the neck and the chin. And generally, a goiter is going to be pretty obvious. Um, you can even see it in these women. This is exophthalmos. This happens because of infiltration of the ocular muscles. And this is relatively unique to, uh, to Graves' disease. And what happens is that you get infiltration of the ocular muscles, and that's going to pull the lids back and cause the, uh, the eyeballs to look like they're protruding. But what's really happening is that the lids are being pulled back. And you can see the, uh, the infiltration here underneath. Here's a severe case of exophthalmos. You can actually see the, the medial uh, muscle of the uh, eye. Okay, and then here's pretibial myxedema. Uh, it tends to occur over the tibia, uh, over, the, over the shins, and it's an indurated erythematous uh, rash. So this would feel this would feel hard compared. The red part, uh, the, the the red rash area should feel uh, firm compared to the rest of the skin. Not all patients with Graves' disease are going to necessarily have this. Okay, so this is an RAIU scan. So this is normal. What you're doing is you're injecting radioactive iodine. This is not the same as a radioactive iodine ablation. Uh, this is a uh, radioactive iodine uptake test. This is just for diagnostic purposes. So you're injecting the patient with iodine, radioactive iodine, and the thyroid is going to take up the iodine if it's healthy. And so this is normal. The thyroid's taking up the iodine, and you can see the iodine um, with the radioactive camera or whatever they're using. With Graves' disease, you've got confluent increase in uh, radioactive iodine uptake. Now, this is in contrast to a multinodular goiter or an adenoma where you've got a hot spot right here or you've got multiple hot spots. Here you've got confluent increased uptake. Okay, so what about toxic nodular goiter? So toxic nodular goiter includes... Uh, this toxic multinodular goiter and the toxic adenoma. They're really just the same thing, just with the multinodular goiter, you have multiple of them. With the adenoma, you just have one. So the symptoms are going to be hyperthyroid symptoms, as we've mentioned several times, and then goiter. And the physical exam will also uh, appreciate a nodule. So rather than having confluent uh, goiter, you're going to have a nodule where you feel a little bump. And that's going to be that hot spot. Um, or you may appreciate multiple of them. Now the best initial test, again, because the patient has hyperthyroidism, the best initial test is going to be a TSH level. After that, then you're going to get the radioactive iodine uptake scan. And the reason that you want to get a TSH level here is because, well, you might think, well, duh, doesn't this have to be uh, a low TSH because you've got, you've got these, these adenomas? And the fact is actually no. Just because you have these, these nodules on your thyroid doesn't mean you have to have an elevated TSH. Sure, the patient may have hyperthyroid symptoms, but a patient may come in with a nodule and maybe they have a normal TSH level. And if they have a normal TSH level, that's concerning because that could possibly be cancer. And so the next step after that would actually be a fine needle aspiration because we'd want to check them out for cancer. Patients who have a low TSH, uh, who have nodules, we know that those nodules are almost certainly functioning. 
And so we want to just make sure they're functioning, and we do that by getting the radioactive iodine uptake scan. And then when we see it, we see the hot spots. We see that, oh, look at here's these nodules that are pulling in a ton of iodine. And so then we know that these are active nodules, and uh, that's reassuring that this is not cancer. These are just adenomas. So the treatment for toxic nodular goiter, whether it's an adenoma or whether it's multinodular, is going to be propranolol for the hyperthyroid symptoms, but then for the actual nodules themselves, uh, we're going to treat them with radioactive iodine ablation. And there's no need to biopsy because carcinomas are non-functional. So you don't need to do a biopsy, nor do you need to do a fine needle aspiration. The only time you need to do that is if the, is if the uh, adenomas are uh, or if the uh, adenomas are non-functional, so if the TSH level was normal or the patient didn't have hyperthyroid symptoms. And so this is just, again, you can see that these are active adenomas. Okay, thyroiditis. So I did an entire section on thyroiditis, so we're only going to just touch on it briefly here uh, in the context of hyperthyroidism. So the thyroiditis that can present with transient hyperthyroidism includes subacute thyroiditis, lymphocytic or postpartum thyroiditis, and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. When the thyroid gland becomes inflamed, as it does in all of these because it's thyroiditis, which is by definition an inflammation of the thyroid, what happens initially is that the T3 and T4 that's being stored in the thyroid spills out in the bloodstream. So you have an initial transient hyperthyroidism. All of these are eventually going to move on to hypothyroidism. But initially, you can have symptoms of hyperthyroidism, and it will be primary hyperthyroidism because you're spilling out T3 and T4, and that's going to suppress TSH. So you would have the pattern of primary hyperthyroidism hyperthyroidism. Now the symptoms of course are overall going to be acute or overall going to be similar to uh, uh, any kind of acute primary hyperthyroidism where you have hyperthyroidism symptoms and goiter with a couple exceptions. Uh, with subacute thyroiditis you actually have pain and that's unique. So subacute thyroiditis will actually have a goiter that's painful. And that's very, very unique to subacute thyroiditis. And with that, knowing that you have a painful thyroiditis, you can, you can say that the most probable diagnosis or most likely diagnosis in this patient is subacute thyroiditis. Generally in thyroiditis, exophthalmos and visual symptoms should not be present. That's uh, something that's more with Graves' disease. So, for diagnosis, again, the best initial test in any patient with hyperthyroidism is going, hyperthyroid symptoms is going to be a TSH level. The next best step is going to be depending on what you're suspecting. So if uh, you're suspecting Graves' disease, then you should get a uh, TSI. If you're suspecting thyroiditis, then you should get an RAIU scan. Now, when would you suspect Graves' disease? Well, if you have exophthalmos and visual symptoms. When would you suspect thyroiditis? Well, you would suspect thyroiditis if you had pain. You would uh, suspect subacute thyroiditis. Or, for instance, if the patient was postpartum. So, if this happens in a woman, she's hyperthyroid and she's three months postpartum then you would probably get an REIU scan. But either of these could be appropriate next best steps. It really depends on what's more uh, suspicious. So you could have thyroiditis, but you may need to get a TSI because it's not a painful thyroiditis and it's not a postpartum patient. And therefore, you really have no reason to outrule Graves' disease, because not all Graves' disease patients are going to have exophthalmos and visual symptoms. And because Graves' disease is a little bit more, is the number one cause of, uh, of hyperthyroidism, you'd want to get a TSI. But if the patient has a painful thyroiditis 
or if they have a, uh, if they're postpartum, then you should get an RAIU scan. And the reason that an RAIU scan is going to be helpful in determining thyroiditis from Graves' disease is because in thyroiditis, and all of the thyroiditis, regardless of which one it is, regardless of what stage you're in, the uptake in thyroiditis is going to be very low, even if you have hyperthyroidism. And the reason is because even though you have hyperthyroidism, the gland is damaged. So you're... You're, ha you're getting hyperthyroidism because the gland has been damaged and it's spilled out T3 and T4 and that's causing hyperthyroidism, but the gland is damaged and now it can't take up iodine. And so because it can't take up that radioactive iodine, you're going to have a low uptake and that's going to distinguish it from Graves' disease. In Graves' disease, you have perfectly healthy thyroid tissue. The only thing is it's overstimulated by the immunoglobulin and so the uptake is going to be high. So radioactive iodine uptake scan will definitively differentiate any of the thyroiditis from Graves' disease. Okay, now factitious hyperthyroidism. The thing that separates this apart from all of the other hyperthyroidisms is that factitious hyperthyroidism was, does not have goiter. What is factitious hyperthyroidism? You probably know just by the fact it's called factitious. It's when patients exogenously inject themselves with thyroid hormones. So it could be a, it could be a patient that uh, is on thyroid hormone. Perhaps she's got levothyroxine and she's over injected herself with uh, too much thyroid hormone. Maybe it was by accident. Uh, or it's a patient that uh, has a family member that's got thyroid hormone and they're feigning symptoms, so they injected themselves. Either way, factitious hyperthyroidism, when you're getting exogenous thyroid hormone that's not created in your body, you're not going to have goiter. Why don't you get goiter? Because goiter is the thyroid being active or the thyroid being inflamed. When you have hyperthyroidism due to the fact that you're getting exogenous thyroid hormone, you just get thyroid hormone from outside your body. So the thyroid doesn't do anything. So the thyroid is not going to be enlarged. So again, the best initial diagnostic test in any patient with hyperthyroidism is to get a TSH level. That's the, I can't emphasize that enough. The best initial test in any patient with hyperthyroid symptoms is to get a TSH level. Of course here we would suspect that the TSH levels are going to be low, the exogenous thyroid hormone just like regular thyroid hormone, natural thyroid hormone is going to suppress TSH and the T3 and T4 is going to be high. The best test to distinguish factitious hyperthyroidism from regular hyperthyroidism from another natural cause is to get a thyroglobulin level. And thyroglobulin levels in all the other hyperthyroidisms will be high. And uh, in factitious hyperthyroidism, the thyroglobulin level will be low or normal. And the treatment for factitious hyperthyroidism is psychotherapy. So this is just to recap, um, don't memorize this. This is just kind of telling you how you can go through this uh, algorithmically. Um, questions you should be asking yourself. Always get a TSH level. That's the best initial test because you want to differentiate uh, low uh, or primary from secondary. And then another thing is that if you have a high TSH, that can also be a sign that the patient has amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism. And uh, you, could also, you would also have hints that the patient has amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism just for the fact that they're on amiodarone. Okay, so this is just a recap. Uh, so in all of the hyperthyroidisms, you're going to have a low TSH, except for the secondary hyperthyroidisms, which are, uh, um, that should say secondary hyperthyroidism. I always make a mistake somewhere. <laughs> I should proofread these. Uh, 
Okay, so the second, this should say secondary hyperthyroidism, in which case you're going to have a high TSH, and in amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism, you're going to have a high TSH. In Graves' disease, the additional uh, symptoms and physical findings will be exophthalmos, visual deficits, mixed edema, other autoimmune disorders. The most accurate test is the TSI, which should be positive. An RAIU scan would show confluent increased uptake of radioactive iodine. The treatment is propranolol for the acute symptoms. PTU and methimazole uh, is medical therapy. PTU is only to be used, you only use PTU in pregnant women. Uh, radioactive iodine ablation can be used in adults and non-pregnant women. Subtotal thyroidectomy can be surgical treatment for patients that fail radioactive iodine ablation or in patients that are pregnant or children. Toxic nodular goiter, you're going to find nodules. The most accurate test is an RAIU scan where you'll find the hot spots. The best treatment is radioactive iodine ablation. Thyroiditis, again, you're going to have a low TSH. The additional symptoms and findings would be pain, uh, which is in subacute thyroiditis, or for instance, postpartum, if the patient has postpartum thyroiditis, the most, active, or most accurate test is going to be a radioactive iodine scan, which should show low uptake. And to differentiate between the different thyroidites, uh, there are different tests, and that's addressed in the thyroiditis section. Treatment for thyroiditis is going to be propranolol for symptoms, uh, and then there are other therapies that vary depending on the type. For factitious hyperthyroidism, the additional symptom that you're going to notice, additional physical finding, is a lack of goiter. The most accurate test, if there's no goiter, uh, is going to be a thyroglobulin, which would be low. And uh, the treatment for factitious hyperthyroidism is more than likely going to be psychotherapy. Struma ovarii is a uh, thyroid hormone secreting tumor in the uh, ovaries. And uh, what you would see in struma ovarii is a, an abdominal mass. Uh, and the most accurate test here would be abdominal CT or MRI, um, knowing that MRI is more accurate than CT all the time. The treatment would be resection. For, primary, or for secondary hyperthyroidism, which would be an adenoma of the anterior pituitary, additional symptom or finding could be bitemporal hemianopsia if it's large enough. The most accurate test is going to be an MRI. The treatment is going to be uh, resection. And amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism, you're going to have a high TSH. Uh, the additional finding would be a patient that's on amiodarone. And the most accurate test, uh, there is none. It's going to be clinical because the patient's on amiodarone. And the treatment would be to discontinue amiodarone. And that's it.